You're listening to Girls with Grafts, a burn community podcast created by Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, a leading nonprofit dedicated to supporting the burn community. In this podcast, we'll talk with burn survivors, share resources to help with supporting and improving burn recovery, and discuss how to prevent burn injuries. Here are your hosts, burn survivors and Phoenix Society's marketing team, Amber Wilcox and Rachel Anderson. Hello, thank you for joining another episode of Girls with Graphs. I am Rachel Anderson and I'm one of your hosts and I'm joined by my lovely co-host Amber Wilcox. Hey everyone, I'm so excited that we're live today too because this is a great opportunity for some really great discussion. Uh, and we have an amazing guest today. Uh, and before we introduce her, I do want to send over a special thank you to our season one sponsor, Pritzker Hakeman. Uh, and with that, Rachel, do you want to start off with our introductions today? Yes, yes. So I'm honored to have to know our guest for a few years now. So I'm happy to welcome Flodia Swift here. She is an appearance activist and the CEO of Face Equality International. So FEI, Face Equality International, is an NGO campaigning to end nation experienced by the global facial differences community. So I know many of our community members have heard of FBI Face Equality Week. Um, and, you know, we're happy to have Lydia here um, because after sustaining facial scars in a car accident in 2016, she set out to reshape the negative narratives that dictate the public perception of scars and disfigurements. Her TEDx explores the harms caused by disproportionately poor media representation of facial difference via, you know, villains and vulnerable people on the screen. Um, and, you know, when she's not working on face equality, she is probably crossfitting, sea dipping, or cooking up some vegan food. And when she gets the time, she also does some art, which includes painting and illustration. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I always get such a warm welcome by the Phoenix Society. So it's always really nice to collaborate with you all. Yes, we are so happy to have you here. I know we just had our face equality um, forum. Was that just last week? Seems like maybe a longer ago than that, but I guess it was just last week. <laughs> so was. yes, it's <laughs> so nice to you know be seeing you again. And again, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. So, Philida, Phoenix Society is a proud member of Face Equality International. For those that are just watching or may not be familiar, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the organization and maybe a little bit about the organization as a whole so that anybody listening or watching us today can learn a little bit more about you? Sure. So interestingly, yeah, Phoenix Society are a founder member of FEI. So first and foremost, we are a, a membership. We call ourselves the Alliance. Um, we set up in November 2018 by the late Dr. James Partridge OBE, who was himself a burn survivor, a kind of pioneer in this movement, um, someone who previously set up Changing Faces UK um, and similarly to myself he was in a car accident I believe when he was 18 years old came out with significant scarring all over his body um, and had a lot of reconstructive surgery on his face um, and he then went on to university 
um, became kind of a successful teacher um, and he wrote a book called Changing Faces where he tracked his journey um, readjusting to life, going to university, dealing with the stigma um, of now looking very different um, and he recognised the need for psychosocial support uh, that recognise the unique challenges that are experienced by anybody who has a facial difference. Um, and he then set up Face Equality International in 2018. Um, and I joined very shortly after that to lead on the communications. We worked very closely together up until the point where he died in August 2020. And I then took over um, and have been in this role since January last year trying and I say to people all of the time it's a it's a worthy shadow to be living in um, and he left behind an incredible legacy um, and so many people that I speak to day in day out know James and the work that he did and pioneering the face equality movement so it's it's an honor to be able to carry on in his footsteps. Well, I think you've been doing an amazing job in your role. And I would, you know, want to kind of ask you about that. You know, this was kind of a sudden, you know, change for you to become, you know, almost the face of face equality. Um, so what's it been like as, you know, a younger female leader, you know, running this alliance? And also for those who don't know, this alliance is across the globe. It's not just, you know, the United States and the UK, there are multiple organizations in it. You know, it's a, it's a global organization, a global alliance. Yeah. So it's, it's been, it's been a lot. And I, it was by no means something that I set my like sights on. Um, if I'm kind of joking in conversation with people, depending on how polite the conversation is, I'll say to people that I literally fell like butt first into this. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been incredible. And I have been so grateful um, for the support that I have had. And this is something that I actually spoke about at um, the most recent kind of Phoenix um, World Burn Congress was we were talking about when people tap you on the shoulder and when they say I have faith in you and how that like ignites this drive in people and mm -hmm. working very closely with James he definitely just had a huge amount of faith in me when we were starting up this thing he had an idea he had his kind of reputation behind him but he really enabled me to just take our social media and our communications and just run with them. And that in itself really kind of instilled in me that faith to say, OK, well, I do trust your kind of sense of direction. And this is a really, really tricky, complex, very unique issue. Yes, we all want the same things. Yes, we don't want a world that has these kind of narrow beauty ideals and we don't want a world with discrimination. We have a very clear vision, but the the experience of facial difference is so diverse. Um, so it is, it is a tricky thing to navigate, but he really did have faith in me and the network that he built around him, again, has been hugely supportive of me within my role, including his family and the board of trustees of FEI. Um, and they are very much in my corner at all times and being critical friends and helping me to be better. So I'm incredibly grateful for all of the support that I've had. And similarly, operating as a membership as well, there is so much expertise around me. And we really try and kind of foster that collaborative spirit and recognise that we are all kind of stronger if we're working together, saying the same thing at the same time, you know, coordinating everything is is really tricky, especially with like multiple time zones and multiple <laughs> languages. And right. yeah, it's 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 really tricky, but it's it's always a joy. Um and it's always really a like the, the best part about it is finding people that have that kind of sense of common purpose and and recognizing that we we have this thing that we can all kind of really, really work towards together. Mm -hmm. So I wanna take a, a moment to talk about, um, I think your passion, right? Like um, every survivor I think has a different passion for, for what brought them here into the room, right? So um, if it's okay and you're, you're 
able to, or wanting to, can you share with us what, what drives you to be so passionate about this mission? Um, and kind of really talk about what, what the, you know, FEI stands for as a whole. Right. So, um, yeah, it, is that something you want to, to chat with? Yeah, about? absolutely. I, I have, I very much have to be an open book with my role. Um, and it's an, I've been on an interesting journey. So, um, I was in a car accident in 2015. Um, I was supposed to be volunteering in Ghana. Um, and on the first full day there, we were driving overnight. Um, the roads in Ghana are hectic. And our driver tried to overtake and basically just collided with another vehicle. And the whole side of the car that I was in just crumbled in. Um, and I had a whole host of different injuries. But I basically woke up in this minivan on the side of a road and my whole face had been cut open and I wasn't in pain um but I could just feel it um and yeah the whole gory horrific kind of story that a lot of burn survivors will be able to kind of resonate with is something that I now feel like happened to a different person um, it is something that I've kind of disassociated with, but at the same time, I've built my entire career around it now. <laughs> so there was a massive, massive adjustment that um, I had to go through. At the time, I was 22 years old, and I was in my in the summer between my second and third year of university, being your average young female, going out drinking too much, getting dressed up, doing my makeup, taking pride in my appearance. Um, and then all of a sudden I had this thing on my face that I associated with something that is ugly, it's not desirable. Whenever I'd seen someone that looked like me on screen, they were vulnerable or they were a, a villain. Um, and I hated that. And I also hated the, like, more than anything else, I hated that people might look down on me or pity me or think, oh, well, she's never going to feel beautiful again. She's never going to feel feminine again. She's never going to feel confident again. And that is what sparked in me this like utter rage that I wanted to kind of prove people wrong. And I wanted to kind of fueled by spite, spite, purely by spite. I just wanted to go out there and say, well, no, actually, my style's really cool. Actually, I've been through this major thing that is a massive test of my character. And actually, my scar can be seen as beautiful. And actually, I want the world to know that. And I want the world to stop kind of belittling me, like people that look like me and only projecting us as this one dimensional person in society. So, yeah. It, it didn't necessarily come from this kind of old, like altruistic, lovely place. It came from rage. <laughs> um, and I think what you said was so, because because I've heard this before, the disassociating, right? Like I know for me um, in the beginning, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm just talking about my story all the time. And I'm sure now you're forced to do it, right? Or not even forced, but you do it all the time and talk about it. But I, we just had JR on the podcast and, and JR Martinez said the same thing of like, he's gotten so used to telling his story and so comfortable. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what got you to that place of feeling like that's not even me? Yeah. And this is the thing is I, I go through waves of being very open and, and not. So in the immediate aftermath, I probably very quickly as I've just said there, wanted to turn this into a positive. I was like, right, like this is a really negative situation. The way that I'm going to deal with it is I'm going to channel it into something positive. I immediately reached out to charities. I immediately started sharing my story. And despite the, you know, the advice of psychologists who were like, well, do you really want to be doing this? Isn't this a bit soon? I did it. And then actually I hadn't fully healed I was out there sharing my story in the Daily Mail, in the tabloids, all of these kind of really massive platforms that are still there on Google to this day, the first thing that comes under my name. And they completely butchered it. They, they said, you know, all these lies, all these sensationalized headlines. 
And that made me want to retreat. And that made me not want to share my story any longer because it was just playing into that net narrative. I thought, oh yeah, they're gonna share my story. That's gonna do some good. And it didn't, it just played into that kind of overarching narrative that we are just this like dramatic horror crash, all of that stuff. It made me retreat, but then at the same time, I didn't lose that fire. I didn't lose that kind of desire to want to do something about it. So I took a role at Changing Faces behind the scenes where it wasn't dependent on me having to share my story, but I could still work towards the cause. And then I realized when I became a chief exec of FEI that I'd need to start telling it again. Um, and that's when I went to therapy because I was like, oh God, I need to prepare for this. And now I'm very boundaried about it. And now, like you say, I can, it's not so much that I'm disassociated from it. It's it's something that is a massive part of me and working in this space, whatever it is, it takes its toll because it, it is, I'm that bit more emotionally tied to it. It has it when something goes wrong or when I share my story and you get the woke police and the political correctness police being like, come on, you just need to stop being a snowflake, that kind of thing, that that hurts. Um, mm. But I, I, have some, I have some tools now, I have some armor um, and I can, I can connect with the person that I was at the time of the crash, mm. but I can also kind of check into who I am now and everything I've learned and the support network that I have around me and I can tell it because I do realize that if I tell it in the right way and in the right spaces in a way where I'm empowered, it can make a difference. But I am very, very boundary about it now. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I mean, I'm sure even just telling your story year after year, you know, it changes. You may focus mainly on the crash, like that actual accident when it happened. But now you talk about, yes, this happened. And you just, you talked about it for maybe what, 30 seconds just now. And now it's all about what am I doing with my story and how can I help other people? So, you know, I love to hear that. Um, and you mentioned Changing Faces. They are one of the um, organizations in Face Align. So, or Face Equality, excuse me. Um, but when you started your role there, were you looking for, you know, a way to kind of give back or what made you, what inspired you to um, work for Changing Faces? Yeah, so I reached out to them, as I said, very, very early on saying, can I do something? What can I do? Can I volunteer? Can I get involved? I want to meet other people that have similar experiences. Um, so I volunteered. I became a media volunteer. I shared my story um again this is this is a coping mechanism that I've re I've recognized now it's like I have to do something positive out of this and sometimes to my own detriment but it actually worked out really really well for me and it just so happened that I had left university and I did not want to do what I'd gone to uni to do I, I was basically studying 3D design and I didn't get that sense of purpose from it so it, it all seemed to work very fortuitously and I am one of those people that thinks kind of oh, everything kind of happens for a reason so it did all work out quite well and a campaigns officer role came up that I saw on Instagram and I just thought I'm massively underqualified for this but I'm going to apply for it anyway <laughs> um, and I got it and the rest is history I worked on some incredible things when I was there I worked on a hate crime campaign I worked on the I am not your villain campaign that was how I got my TEDx, was kind of working it there and talking about it more and just taking a slightly more of a professional stance on it. Um, so talking about it more from, OK, well, this is like the it's not just about me. It's about the movement. It's about the community. And, and this is what is needed in society to change um, in order to make face equality a thing. Mm -hmm. So I want to pause there because I heard you, you know, talk about your TEDx, which is in the, we've linked and all linked in the podcast description, but I also heard you say, you know, talking about the media. And so Halloween just happened, right? And um, you had an amazing campaign um, and are, we're calling for some recognition. And I know, um, 
the community that, you know, the, the survivor, burn survivor community has also really, really put some focus on this. We just did some research um, with some surveys here. And that was like the number two thing that mm-hmm. survivors just widely believe is important, right? To have proper representation. And so I know that's something that comes up a lot in our community. And, and even further, I was just watching Dancing with the Stars two weekends ago and happened to see, you know, a representation of somebody being two-faced, right? So they have the scar and and it made me so angry in that moment of thinking like, oh my gosh, why do we continue to do this in just regular media outlets? So um, I want you to talk a little bit about that campaign, but then, you know, let's talk about that, right? <laughs> the recognition <laughs> of that as a whole, right? So uh, yeah. Yeah, so we um, were approached by a creative agency called Leith um, in the weeks running up to Halloween saying, we've got this idea. Uh, And it was someone who actually has a venous malformation, um, which is basically a birthmark. And she was working for this agency, agency and she said, I keep looking on TikTok and there are so many makeup artists that are there's this whole trending Freddy Krueger sound. There's this whole trending makeup look, people making themselves up to look like Freddy Krueger. I want to do something about it. I want to directly challenge. And so much of this stuff, it's interesting you say about Dancing with the Stars, so much of this kind of representation, it's not done with malice. It's not, it's it's just pure and utter ignorance. Mm -hmm. And it, the fact that we don't yet in society recognize, and neither would I have done before I got my own scars, I wouldn't have recognized that this is an equality issue, this is a marginalized identity mm-hmm. that are having their real life experiences kind of appropriated and taken and used. And there is this really, really harmful link between facial difference and like scary and fear and something other than and horror films and gore and villains it's it's really problematic and also there's the link between like inhuman and human as well we've called out um casting directors in the past that were casting for orcs in lord of the rings to be played by people with missing eyes and there's this really really tricky kind of space in tv and film for our community and the most kind of gut-wrenching element of it is that we're continuing to tell young people um, that facial difference is something to fear that when you see it on screen it's a it's a visual cue for a character who you're not to trust it's like oh yeah that's the baddie Mm -hmm. Um, and that is really really harmful and sadly despite years and years of trying to call this stuff out there doesn't seem to be a great deal of recognition yet from film and tv um Mm -hmm. and it's something that we are actively trying to work towards at all times and calling it out when we do see it so let's talk about that campaign the halloween campaign so um what are some ways that you know fei was able to kind of bring representation in a positive light or or you know in an important light to that um you know, this past Halloween? Yeah. So what we did was we spoke to a couple of community members, um, some people with burn scars, some people with facial palsy, and they relayed comments, real life comments. It wasn't scripted. It was real life comments that they have had held at them around Halloween or where they've been directly compared to characters um, and where they've had things like, things said to them like oh I see you've got your Halloween costume sorted me myself I've had people come up to me on Halloween and say oh my god is that makeup that's amazing and I'm like no it's it's my real face um but I'm glad that you think it's a Halloween costume and I'm glad that you think it's scary um and I've had kids say to me that my they think my face is scary as well so what we did was compiled a bunch of those very short clips, put together a TikTok video um, and with some kind of messaging as well. So just about considering the real people behind your Halloween costume. And we put that out 
and it got thousands and thousands of views it got lots of reshares and what we did in a light touch way was we did try and engage with some makeup artists we weren't publicly calling them out but what we were doing is saying please just consider this video we wanted to create an educational piece we wanted to create a conversation and largely the response from the community in particular was very very positive mm. there was a bit of backlash as there always is mm. but generally that's a sign that we're reaching beyond our echo chamber um so generally when we get some negative comments we're like yes we're doing this is this is working yeah there's conversation right i always believe that even, <laughs> even if there's some mm -hmm. negative right it, you're talking about it so we we've started to have that conversation and i think that's important. What would you say to a makeup artist or, and, and kind of in your own words, right? I know what I would say, but, but I think um, to somebody like that, that maybe has done that type of, type of makeup in the past, but, but maybe I think you're right. I think some of it is like pure ignorance of, I, I haven't met a burn survivor or I haven't met someone with facial scars before. So I didn't know that that affects you. Um, and so I think that is something that is important to understand is they may not know how, right? So what would you say to somebody like that? I think that's exactly it. It's actually being open to hearing the experiences of someone and being open to hearing perhaps the advice around celebrating in a more inclusive way. Um, that again, that's what that's what that's what I find really difficult um, is when you put your heart out there, you put out these really tricky experiences and you are saying, this hurts me personally, this hurts the community that I am a part of. And then the response is like, oh, come on, like grow up, you're a snowflake. And that's that's what we're constantly fighting against. And that's what lots of marginalized communities are fighting against. And it's not gonna stop us, but it's, it is, it is a constant battle. Mm. And I think you're, the comment you made about social media, right? Like, um, I think a lot of folks don't realize the comments I've I've heard directly from friends of what is being said to them about their scars, um, and that can really be harmful, right? And really, it doesn't matter who you are. I think um, whether you can try to brush them off or not, the comments that are out there um, for survivors can be really, really impactful for them and and just isn't great right so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know while we're kind of on the topics of campaigns too you know before we went live we were talking a little bit about the international labor campaign too that fbi is working on so can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that since this one i feel like is a little you know more niche and not as you know commonly known or talked about <laughs> Yeah, so I literally just before this got off of a webinar with the International Labour Organization, which is an agency off of the UN. Um, and it, we were talking about artificial intelligence. And there's a blog that's currently on our website um, that talks through all of this stuff in like a very kind of simple way. Because you say AI and you think of like self-driving cars and robots taking over the world and oh, this is all way into the future. This isn't really having an impact on us in the here and now, but it absolutely is. So massive kind of corporate companies are already using AI um, kind of software for recruitment, for example, where you have a video kind of um, interview process. And that interview process will give you a score according to the language that you use, um, the way that you express yourself, your facial expressions, how much you move around. So if it's making an assessment of your facial expressions and you have a tight scar that is inhibiting the way that your face moves, for example, or the way that you smile, it will it will negatively score you down. Um, other areas where AI is having an impact right now is particularly, I believe, in the burn community where people are having their photos blurred out on social media mm -hmm. and more sensitive or violent, like whole positive movements around scars are being removed from social media and people are being censored mm -hmm. 
social media thinks that it's graphic and that it's bad when these are actually just people using social media, expressing themselves, wanting to actually be visible. That's all that's all AI, that's all algorithms. Um, and other things are kind of photo ID, so people failing um, to have their faces register as human faces for getting photo ID or passport gates, all of those things, that is AI. And that is having a really, really kind of negative impact already. And it's only going to get worse. We were talking about mm -hmm. it being the fourth industrial revolution. And the problem is, is that it's hard enough in the here and now to prove discrimination. So from an employer to from, you know, in, oh, I didn't get the job and I, I'm pretty sure it's to do with the way I look, but I can't prove it. This is mm -hmm. going to be worse when it's just a machine, mm -hmm. when you want to figure out all where this is coming from. So this is something that we're trying to keep on top of mm -hmm. and trying to kind of break it down um, and talk about it more within our community spaces so that people are aware of it and so that we can kind of, I don't know, turn the tide yeah. somehow. I Definitely. think it's important. I In my past life, I worked for some software companies, specifically ones that had security right around this. And one of the biggest questions they got quite a bit was, um, for, for persons of color, right? Does the, the AI recognize this? And I, this was never even something I think that I was even aware of. And so um, even challenging the companies out there that make, whether it's a security software or facial recognition, recognition is used a lot more than we think these days. And so I think while we, like you said, while we think it's more about like, oh, these self-driving cars and all of these things, uh, we would be surprised, I think, at how much this this already exists. And so really thinking about how often does it recognize properly a person um, with a facial difference. So um, mm -hmm. th this is particularly an area where I dove into a little bit. And, and until, you know, you've brought that up to me, I even thought, oh, that's another area of something that someone who is purchasing this type of software would would want to ask, right? Of does it recognize facial differences? And, and when it does, does it do it in the, in the appropriate way and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and does it kind of disadvantage? Does it mark you down in any way? Does it screen you out of the process? Um, and yeah, it, it is gathering a lot of traction around, as you say, how AI disadvantages people of colour um, and other communities and people with disabilities as well, because it completely removes any kind of reasonable adjustment um, within these processes. So, you know, I have to link to approve a transaction on my banking right. app mm -hmm. um, or even facial recognition to open my phone. Is mm -hmm. that going to work universally right. for people? And um, yes, maybe you could put in a passcode as a kind of alternative, but if that's more cumbersome and that's taking more time. That's not fair for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we think about, I know, because I think one of the questions we often ask during that too, is like the masks, right? So it, a lot of time during COVID, it didn't recognize me right from above the eye. And so there is technology out there that can recognize this, but it's important to realize like that there's a possibility that it may not recognize because of, we don't necessarily look like other folks. So I think that those are important questions to start challenging anyone who's purchasing, right? Any kind of facial recognition software. I, I particularly think this is a big um, area of opportunity mm -hmm. for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something to keep on top of, something to be aware of, something to engage in. Um, it's clear that the software, like, I, I, my understanding of the issue, and this is not from a technical standpoint, but it's <laughs> the data sets that they've built with software are just narrow. So as with lots of things, they're just not used to seeing diverse faces. So we want to help with that. Like we want to be preventing these problems rather than trying to undo them. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to work with tech companies, with developers, with social media platforms. We are here and ready to be consulted. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the yeah. social media platforms is a big one because I, you know, I personally have heard from several survivors if I put my images out there and Facebook took them down or TikTok took them down. And so um, I think that that's a challenge right now too. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you hear that quite a bit as well. Well, that's, you know, that is literally censorship. <laughs> 
that is literally preventing someone from expressing themselves freely and using a platform that is a great place to be for building communities, for connecting with people that have that shared experience. But the platforms are basically removing that right from mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And and there is a difference. I just want to point this out, you know, of a fresh burn in a hospital, posting a photo of that can be triggering for survivors. And or I'm just using that as an example. No, but good, when TikTok is taking down or and we've heard it on dating apps on like Bumble and mm -hmm. all those that you're just posting a photo of myself smiling at a cafe with friends and it's getting taken down because it's considered graphic content. So there, I mean, that just shows that there's a problem in the AI or the whatever algorithm that they're using. Cause there is a difference. Yes. I, I think of, I there are some you. graphic <laughs> content, but yeah, we're, sure. we're talking about just a normal smiling photo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I've had graphic images of my scars being bloody and all gross that I've posted out there that I have been censored. And that's one thing, but for me to post a healed version of my scar that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily look graphic is just who I am. Um, I think that's mm -hmm. a great point, Rachel. Yeah, I, I wish I'd picked up on that sooner because you're completely right. And that's what's similar with the media representation stuff as well, because there is blood and guts and gore, which mm -hmm. potentially graphic. Yes, agreed. But you're right. When things are healed and we can very easily make that distinction in the here and now, that makes total sense to us. But it doesn't make sense to a machine. And sadly, sometimes it doesn't make sense make sense to human moderators either. Because they're just the not used to this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I I know especially and um, the one I'm thinking of, and I know Rachel is, is, is <laughs> someone who posted, you know, Bumble with friends. So this person wasn't even looking for a date, right? Just looking for another friend out there and knowing that bumble took that right away from that person just because it saw a scar right on 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 them and it wasn't even and you know it was just their face right and their body and um so that can be that can be detrimental too and especially somebody who's putting themselves out there to meet another person right mm -hmm. so a dating app or whatnot i imagine that can be really hurtful for somebody uh, that is just looking to connect with another human well, that's it. That's it. And it's really inhibiting people's opportunities as well. And what is really sad is that theoretically AI could prevent some of those human biases that we know exist that are like inbuilt through generations of being exposed to these like really awful stories. AI doesn't necessarily have that. But what it does have is, is it's limited by those that program it. And you're right, it is preventing people from making that human connection. And that's, that's brutal. It's, mm -hmm. it's just brutal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so mine, I have a story to share. It's a little different. I wasn't on an app or anything. But I remember when I was younger, we went to a museum, I think it was like, a school field trip or something. And this was, you know, years and years ago. But they had this camera that would scan your face and then show you what you looked like. And I think it was like 30 years or something. And I just remember they scanned my face and it popped up and I, my face was so distorted. It was, I looked completely different than all of my friends looked like. And I mean, that was years ago, but it's just a little example, example. of like it real. And I would also like to say I have some facial scars, but they blend in pretty well with my skin where I know that's not everyone's journey, but you would even think like mine are very minimal and that still had a crazy distortion on I, and that, I, that had an impact on you still because you're I still, still remember it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that yeah. just shows the impact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's crazy um but and one other thing I wanted to bring up too was you know we're talking about campaigns and you know every year we have face equality week um and I know many of our members have you know joined in um with the selfie that we've done a few years um, but can you just tell us a little bit more about, you know, Face Equality Week in general and, you know, some of the campaigns we've done in the past? Yeah, for sure. So it's been running in an international sense, I think, since 2019. But then it started um, and changed in, with Changing Faces in the UK. And then it went to um, Taiwan, I believe. <coughs> 
excuse me um and each year there's a theme but it's very much about um bringing the community together excuse me <laughs> but yes it is um like i said i know some of you have shared those videos before and that selfie um, and we have it running across the bottom, but it is coming up in May of next year. So and you have to look connect. out for more. Yeah. yeah. And stay connected with FBI. So, um, I know Philida and her team are great, um, on all social media platforms. Uh, so making sure that we stay connected on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok during that week to be able to take part and be a part of those campaigns as a whole as well. Mm -hmm. Philida, I know. Sorry, you were. <laughs> it's okay. Are you doing well, all right over there? Technical difficulties. You don't anticipate a tickly cough coming out of nowhere, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I, I was live streamed. Like... <laughs> um, well, not human. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. This this podcast is about real people, so uh, <laughs> we all go through that. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of Face Equality Week, I don't think we have a theme just yet. Um, no, in fact, we're currently asking people on our social platforms. There's a story on our Instagram at this very point in time. So we have. <coughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think the, I, we'll just put it out there right now. If anyone has ideas for themes for Face Equality Week. Um, Rachel, do you know what last year's theme was? Well, fill it a it comes it comes back to us here more technical difficulties it was um human rights and then the human rights. yes that's what it was yes so and one thing to keep in mind too with you know the alliance we've been talking about the alliance of organizations so one thing that i love about face equality is you know we're not all burn survivor organizations in the alliance there are you know changing faces is one i'm sure you can list all of that i mean they're listed on the website as well but they all we all have a slightly different mission, but we all come around this common voice and common goal. And that's when people are submitting ideas. I just want to make sure people realize, you know, it's more than just burn survivors. And it's, you know, even more than just looking at a facial scar, you know, for burn survivors, we can have scars all over. And the human rights is a great example of like, Yes, you know, if, if you do have a facial difference that relates to you, but you know, if you have differences on your arms or your legs or wherever it is, we can all relate to that. Um, so, but yeah. yes, we love ideas. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't let the, the name feel as though it's kind of exclusionary in any way. We are very much recognizing we live in this society that prizes kind of a perfect mm -hmm. complexion, perfect skin. A very narrow perception of beauty and that does extend beyond the face that does extend to face and body and you're right there is such kind of diversity of experience and conditions we represent people who are born with facial differences that acquire them that have them episodically and you might be both a burn survivor but you might also have a skin condition you might have a limb difference you might have mm -hmm. all of these different multifaceted human experiences but at the end of the day, none of us want to experience stigma. None of us want to experience discrimination. And that was where the human rights theme came in, was recognizing all too often this is an equality issue that falls behind. Um, and I'm sure this is something you speak about a lot in Phoenix, is about kind of disability, um, whether mm -hmm. perhaps you identify with or you are protected by the law. Um, and what that experience is and whether you feel like that is enough um, to recognize the very unique experiences of having an appearance affecting condition. So mm -hmm. what we kind of set our sights on last year was recognizing that this is an equality issue in its own right, mm -hmm. that face equality is a human right and that is our ultimate vision. Mm -hmm. But that's quite a weighty theme. So if you're thinking about Suggesting another theme, education is one. Mm -hmm. um, in previous years, we've had the selfie on social media. There, there are endless kind of unifying themes that we could focus on. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd be really keen to hear it. And there is so much creativity within this space as well. We've had people mm -hmm. submit illustrations recently, people putting videos together. Um, and that's really what Face Equality Week is, is first and foremost about is 
having some central themes, but providing an opportunity for people to put their own stamp on it. So share their own stories in the context of that big global mm-hmm. moment. Mm. And I think that's important of, of recognizing that there are a lot of opportunities for the community to get involved. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, getting checking out your Instagram story. Um, and in terms of submitting, are there other ways that folks can submit to you, um, perhaps on your website, if they don't, if they're not connected on social media of how to get involved? Yeah, of course. So there's a couple of different ways. So we're always looking for storytellers, people that we can kind of amplify the stories of via either our blog or our social channels. There's actually a story collection form um, that should be on our Instagram kind of, uh, what's it called? Links. Yeah. Yes. Instagram. Um, Yeah, so please always get in touch. A great way to support us is through signing our pledge. So we have a pledge on our website, which is a pledge to make face equality a reality. And then we also have a resource hub on our website, which you might recognize from Phoenix's resource hub because we basically sent screenshots of it to our developers. And that has a whole host of resources that can be used um, if you want to go and speak to a school, if you want to speak to there's a parent's guide on there, if you want to speak to a local business, to your employer. Uh, that's very much about putting those resources out there in a publicly available way so that everybody has the tools that they need to talk about mm-hmm. face quality. Um, so there's a whole different kind of host of touch points either on our website or our social channels. Mm-hmm. And there is a really great guide. I think we have it linked on our website too, but in the resource hub, um, just talking about media and going, you know, talking to the media and talking even to others about face equality. Um, we'll also make sure that's linked below. And we, again, I think it's on both of our websites. We have just kind of a, what is face equality? You know, if you're just trying to have a conversation with someone, you know, education, I think is a really big core here on all of the campaigns that we're working on. It's just educating people. Yeah. Um, so those are some really great resources to check out just to educate yourself and others. And that's what I say to people all the time. We have a lived experience working group and there's a real range of different kind of experiences in there. Some people are out there sharing their story in the media, on social media. Others are much more private and there is no like, right or wrong way to get involved in advocacy and actually some of the hardest conversations that you're going to have are with your nearest and dearest and educating Mm -hmm. maybe kind of younger generations in your family as well those are the really really tricky ones and that is a great place to kind of set your sights on Um, and hopefully yeah we can provide the tools for all of those different types of advocacy So we'll put all of those links, I think, in the the description of the podcast. And I just actually dropped all of that in. So sharing and signing the pledge, um, sharing your story. I think those are all really important things. I know um, I'm very grateful for all of the the information that you're sharing on social media because it allows us to come together with the greater group. Like you said, working together, I think that's really important. And so um, yes, our, our survivors are also encouraged to be a part of that uh, so that we can continue to share all of the messages that we talked about today, because I think that is super, super important. <laughs> um, so, Philida, I think um, I have a couple of last questions here. I think first and foremost, um, I want to say thank you for sharing everything today. But um, as a young female leader, I know I'm sure you can overcome some challenges of your own right in this space. And so um i would love if you share kind of uh your experience as as a young female in in the workforce and and encouraging some of those that are that maybe have facial differences um and are you know younger how can they continue to stay motivated in this space that's a very very good question and something that i ask myself constantly (laughs) it's 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 interesting being a young female leader and being a woman with a facial difference as well we are still we're not just fighting for face equality we are also fight, fighting for our equality as women as well recognizing that for generations we have been prized for our appearance um and it is 
the the odds are stacked very much against us in lots of ways there is this perception of needing to prove yourself more um i am constantly battling with imposter syndrome feeling mm. like i need to know more i need to listen to more business podcasts i need to get better at the financial side of things i need to do this i need to be more professional more corporate constant kind of thoughts mm -hmm. um and I think the moment you recognize that that's all perfectly human and perfectly normal and that actually having those kind of insecurities is actually more about society and not us mm -hmm. <laughs> um, great and having that network around you I have so many mentors I have so many friends and critical friends mm -hmm. um people that I go to when I need them to be yes people and people that I go to when I need them to be no people mm -hmm. um, so kind of surrounding yourself with those people and also just yeah being very human about it as well mm -hmm. as I said I started going to therapy when I started this role um yeah just being I I, I I can sit here and be like, oh, well, you just need to accept help and you just need to surrender. I'm the worst at doing that sometimes. <laughs> Myself I, included. <laughs> yeah, I'm the worst at my own advice. Mm -hmm. it, like, I can't pretend like I'm, I'm that good at it, but it's, it's a process and it's a constant battle with imposter syndrome. Mm, but at the, same time, real. <laughs> at the same time, it, it, it's great because we all have these same we're like we think oh god this is such an individual kind of Problem. personal experience but we all have the same foibles as my gran would say which is mm. like our yeah quirks yeah so how does philida <laughs> practice self-care among all of that i've been asking that question a lot so i'd love to hear it from you I have to exercise um, and I am very much part of the cult that is CrossFit. Um, <laughs> and you're vegan, which I'm a vegetarian. I'm, so. wonder I've, it's a wonder I've got any friends. To be <laughs> it's true. When you're, when you're vegetarian or vegan, they're like, Ugh. you know, like going to a restaurant with you is, <laughs> and I know I that. Know, but, I mean, look, I, I haven't mentioned it. We've been speaking for nearly an hour and it's taken me this long to bring it up at least um, <laughs> it's true <laughs> yeah, no, I, the crossfit as well it, it forces you to be sociable it forces you to be, be part of a community you're all like there, kind of absolutely hating life together but then you come out of it feeling really really good and it's not about appearance there are no mirrors in there it's not about standing in front of a mirror and like flexing and there's none of that like toxic masculine energy that exists in regular gyms either it is very much like very diverse abilities very kind of scalable according to what you can do um bearing in mind you know I've got a whole host of injuries that I still battle with and there's there's limitations but I still very much enjoy it um that is self-care Although maybe it is actually more kind of a form of self-harm in some ways. <laughs> you are literally, yeah, in a pain cave. Um, getting outside is great. Mm. I live right by the sea, which is amazing. Uh, yes, I saw your sea dipping. So um, any just standing in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Again, a massive <laughs> cliche um is that and that's something that I developed during lockdown was like going and jumping in the cold British sea <laughs> well I think I've read a study not too long ago that like jumping or being near water or jumping in water is actually like or being around it is good for our health and so that makes total sense of like I also live close to the water and I need to like see it once in a while just to kind of ground me so that makes total sense yeah i i start going to therapy as well with this like i think she calls herself an ecotherapist and we would walk along the beach and like mm. it would be like traditional therapy but then occasionally she would be like and look out to the sea tell me what the sea is telling you oh that's amazing <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> I, really I need know. that kind of therapist <laughs> like <laughs> let's go for a walk while i'm there because i feel like sometimes sitting in a room can make me like 
mm-hmm. not want to talk as much. So I find myself. Yeah. And we don't have to look at each other either. I don't have to look. I'm very good. And you'll probably notice this when I, when I'm thinking about what I'm saying, I will look off into the distance. And mm-hmm. that's the same when I'm in therapy. I can't look at someone in the eye when I'm trying to formulate a thought. Right. Right. Well, I need that kind of therapist. Yeah. That sounds like a, a good form of therapy. I don't know that I've heard that before, but I think like going for a walk is my husband and I do that, right? We'll go for a walk mm-hmm. and just talk about how we're feeling, but not having to like look at one another while we're talking can be, can be I contact's horrible at it. Like <laughs> so hard, especially since we're all on screen now and like, we don't actually have to look at people all the time. It is, uh, mm-hmm. it is a challenge for sure. Definitely. Awesome. Well, do you have any final thoughts, words, piece of advice, anything you want to share? Um, like, obviously, always reach out, find people <laughs> around you, find, find, your, find your tribe. That's always really valuable. And whether that exists in an online space or even better in a physical space, like physical contact with humans is much needed it's vital for our survival as much as it's getting increasingly more difficult um and then one thing that i didn't mention that is on our resources hub given that we are an organization that talks about discrimination a lot there are some legal resources on our website so some legal fact sheets that have been really kind of broken down and simplified so if you are experiencing anything negative whether it's in the workplace um there are some resources on there that hopefully will help to kind of demystify and help you to better understand your rights whether you're in the states the uk europe um there's some stuff on there that will help awesome we'll add all of those uh resources Mm -hmm. to the podcast description as well once again uh, we want to thank our sponsor pritzker hagman for their season one sponsorship the pritzker hagman burn injury legal team helps burn survivors and their loved ones pursue compensation and justice throughout the united states if you have any legal questions uh for phoenix society for burn survivors and our our team um know that the attorneys at pritzker hagman are ready to help so you can find out more at legaljourney.com guide. Um, And with that, Philida, it has been a true pleasure to speak with you today. We want to thank you for joining us. uh, And we hopefully will hear much more about Face Equality uh, Week coming very soon. Yeah, please do submit your ideas. We'd love to hear them. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Thank you. you so much. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Girls with Crafts. If you are enjoying this content, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.